to have a look at a very standard, very common detail, um, a flat roof with a warm deck um, and with a bit of a green roof on top of it. That detail is from the book Constructing Architecture, Materials, Processes, Structures, which was edited by Andrea Teplatzes. Um, he's a professor at ETH in, uh, in Zurich. I used to study at his chair. Uh, and that book is kind of like the Bible when it comes to constructing details and everything. And I highly recommend having a look at your um, architecture library or even thinking about purchasing that book. It's really, really helpful. I'll link all the details about this publication um, in, the, in the text box below. So feel free to check it out as well. So with that detail, um, I'll just quickly um, highlight some of the key elements, a key material. So of course the load-bearing layer highlighted in red, we have um, uh, a masonry construction for our exterior walls and then a concrete slab for the roof. Um, as you can see, let me quickly get that pen out, there we go, that concrete slab sort of, oops, sort of extends a bit um, to the top, sort of creating um, a ledge that protects our roof. Um, I would say this particular roof construction is just made for um, maintenance, so it's not made for people to walk on, given that we do not have as much of a, uh, a railing or protection for people. But nonetheless, these sort of roofs, they would be accessible for maintenance on a regular basis. Um, and then here, of course, insulation. As a rule of thumb, I would say these kind of dimensions seem a little bit small, I would say, given the climate crisis that we do find ourselves in and the importance of insulation in, in most climatic conditions, I would probably go for a little bit more um, insulation than what we show here. But nonetheless, you will get the idea of um, the concept and principle and how these constructions work. So just to briefly have a closer look at the exterior wall, again, we have masonry on the inside, we have insulation and then there's a bit of a cavity just here that's not particularly for um, an air cavity in this case but that's a tolerance cavity because if you think about it if you have a masonry wall on the outside as well and there's mortar that's kind of you know all of a sudden protruding a little bit on, on, on all sides and um, also your masonry blocks they may not be as precise and they may not be stacked up as properly um, all the time so therefore you give them a little bit of a gap a little bit of a tolerance um, so that the the mortar and everything just doesn't um, get too close to the insulation all the time so that's part of it and when we look at the um, at the roofing um, construction detail again we have concrete here as our load bearing layer and then on top of it there's a screen which is probably made out of a, a cement or a concrete type of material as well and as we can see here in the um, description it says laid to falls which means and you can sort of see it in a detail it's a little bit thicker here than it is on that side so what that does is that given that this layer is a little bit in an, at an incline um, every other layer on top of it, especially the insulation that, he, that is here to follow, will have that incline as well. Therefore, the water can flow um, in that direction. Because on top of that screen, we have, in this case, we have a, um, a vapor barrier, we have thermal insulation, and then on top of that, there is a um, waterproofing membrane. Sometimes you have thermal insulation that is um, waterproof by itself and that will mean um, on that layer actually that's where the water is traveling so the water will seep through all the other layers um, and then on here will travel to your um, pipes and everything so of course that one has an incline given that we have that screed that is laid to fall um, you can do that in a different way. You can also have the insulation laid to fall or you can cut it. You, you, in that case, you would indicate that the insulation is slightly thicker on that side and then a little bit thinner at the end of it. 
or where your water is actually flowing to. But that, of course, means that you have to dimension your insulation sort of at its weakest spot uh, in terms of the thermal performance that you want. And that means you will have a little bit of an excess um, of insulation at the end of it, which I would say isn't too bad. Um, you know, of course, having too much insulation means that you're sort of wasting a little bit of resources. Um, insulation do have a lot of embodied carbon, um, many of them, especially the ones that are on a, on a roof um, detail such as this. Um, and of course, it costs a little bit more money, but nonetheless, it will give you some benefits for the inside, um, for your interior climate as well. So that's one of the most important things that we have to make sure that the water is flowing in, in a specific um, um, position within our roof. We will have a closer look at that in a, on a ground plan in a different video. Um, on top of the insulation and the waterproofing membrane, in this case we have a drainage and protection mat. Again, that's a kind of... Um, a layer that helps for that water to flow through and then on top of it we have some topsoil with um, vegetation so in this case given that the soil is only 60 millimeters it's not very high there's probably only some types of grasses or succulents or mosses growing on this roof of course if you want to have a proper green roof which is a little bit more um, productive in terms of biodiversity and overall benefits um, to our environment you would need much much more topsoil um, really depends on what kind of plants that you want to um, grow on your roof and that of course also means that you will have a little bit more weight that's contributing to your construction especially that soil over time it will um, soak up with water as well if it's raining so it might get heavier um, on the rainy days as well of course, all the benefits of green roofs, um, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about this in a different video as well. Most of you probably know that. And then, of course, again, on that ledge on this side here, um, we want to make sure, once again, that the water is not just flowing down our facade uncontrolled in an uncontrolled way. So we definitely need a little bit of a, uh, a rail just for that protection. Um, again, in this case, it wouldn't be enough um, as, a, as a protection for people, um, but it's, um, it, again, it's, it's for the controlling the water. On top of it here, we have a precast concrete element, which sort of provides that finishing block on our construction. Therefore, again, um, protecting all these layers, all these materials from the rain that's coming. And once again, as you can see, there's a little bit of an incline, making sure that if there's rain sitting on top of that concrete element, it will flow down onto our roof and then go um, to, the, to the actual water management. Rather, once again, then just uncontrollably run down our facade and therefore, you know, you, you'll end up having really wet um, plaster on this side, um, you might have algae growing because of that dampness that's always there. So you want to make sure that the water is always very um, flowing away from your facade, flowing into a controlled kind of direction. That kind of element, it could be made out of a, a metal sheet as well. You, you sometimes see these kind of bent metals, they look a bit like this, um, they might go a bit further down on that, that side as well. But once again, you would have that incline, making sure the water is flowing away. With the insulation layer in this particular case, you can see there's actually a tiny little gap um, up here. The insulation is not really um, continuous in this case, but that's not too big of an issue. Because if you think about heat flux, um, if we have outside temperature up here and an inside temperature down here, the way of that temperature fall is actually really, really far away. So you will have, since you have protection all around here, um, that should be enough. But ideally, 
um, especially if you do have a, a metal sheet or a, a timber construction that's protecting um, your ledge up here, it would be beneficial to have a little bit of a strip of insulation in here as well. In this case, because that concrete element is relatively heavy and it needs to be connected to the load-bearing structure, you can see these little, um, there's some kind of anchorage in here, these dashed lines. Um, you want to make sure that that is a stable um, assembly of these two materials. So you have a little bit of a mortar bed in here and that anchoring um, construction. That's also the reason why that little ledge is actually protruding a tiny bit, so it's a little bit thicker on top of it, making sure that you have more um, uh, a broader connection. If, again, if you think if that one is only like this small, it's a little bit of a, of a vulnerable point, and if there's too much weight coming on that side, you are creating a momentum in that area, which might be too strong and you might might cause some kind of damage and of course you don't want to make it too thick as well like this because then you will lose a lot of um, space for your insulation on the one hand side and on the other hand side you're actually using much more concrete here as well so that's a it's a it's not as easy to make these kind of details um, but it helps um, it helps a lot because again if you think about if all of that would be thicker, you'd have to add more insulation. All of a sudden, your overall wall construction becomes much, much thicker, simply because of that tiny, tiny little detail up on here. So that's one of the ways to go around it. And as you can see here as well with the concrete, um, there's a, a working gap. So that concrete slab, the, uh, the roof slab was cast in one go, or maybe multiple goes, I don't don't know how big that building is and then in a second process they cast that additional element on top of it. That element could be pre-cast as well just as the one on top of here um, if that would make sense in that particular instance. Yeah. So yeah these are some of the, the main features of that detail. The, with these sort of details the most important thing is always to protect your construction from rainwater, specifically from water that's sitting around. Um, if there's liquid water sitting around, that means that the, it potentially could be seeping in into your construction and making it damp, therefore making creating damage. Or um, when your insulation, for instance, gets damp, it means that it becomes inefficient. Most in most types of insulation, at least. And then, second most important thing. Having that kind of concept of waterproofing your construction means that on top of it, um, and I think I haven't properly mentioned that before, but you always want to protect your uh, waterproofing membrane from physical damage. And physical damage means people puncturing that membrane. It means UV light um, over time degrading that membrane because it gets it starts to crumble. And third of all, you want to protect it from, especially in a green roof, if you have vegetation here, these kind of plants, they grow roots, um, and these roots can penetrate the water membrane on, over time. So that's why you have a protection mat in that drainage mat in here included. So that's a, a root barrier, making sure that the plants, the roots of those plants do not puncture um, the water membrane. So those are the, the, the two most important principles when designing most details, but specifically roofing details, making sure that the water management is always um, is well thought through and that you protect your waterproofing membrane. So I hope this helps. Um, we'll have a look at some of the, the other topics that I've mentioned in here at, in, another, um, in another video. Thank you very much.